Welcome to Indoor Voices, presented by Millicare Floor and Textile Care. Join us as we explore the great indoors and talk to experts about how to improve our indoor environments. Welcome to Indoor Voices, brought to you by Millicare Floor and Textile Care. Today we have uh, Antonio Holguin with us today to talk about material health. And like we do with all of our episodes, I like to just make sure to bring in a little bit about our our interviewee. So Antonio, before we jump into our topic today, let's get to know you a little bit. Um, you're in business development for Autex Acoustics. So, so tell us what you do on a daily basis. Yeah. So my role is sales manager. I cover all of Texas, Oklahoma. Um, and on a day to day, you know, I'll give you a good example. Yesterday, I um, had a product presentation virtually in the morning, had a client lunch um, here in Austin, and then ran to drop off some samples and spent every hour kind of minute in between there, you know, running around searching for projects, talking to people, trying to set up next meetings and just uh, getting to know who's here in the market in Austin and also keep in touch with my people in Dallas, Houston. Oklahoma City and Tulsa, every, everywhere else in between. So that's kind of what my, my day-to-day looks like. No, that's awesome. And we're bringing you on this show because we know you have a passion for material health, which is an aspect of sustainability. So what sparked your passion for material health? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, um, you know, I, I do credit a lot of that passion to my previous role at Human Scale. They're the ones that really started showing me what it meant to look at what products are made out of. Um, But I think even beyond that, that topic was important to me because I have a younger brother who's on the autism spectrum. And so knowing that there's a lot of things in our environment, our day to day lives that impact our health as humans, um, it it really kind of just triggered this passion to to find out more and find out what we can do uh, in our roles as designers, architects and manufacturers. Yeah, you, I mean, you have a personal story there that I, I absolutely love. And in, and in getting to know you, um, you've explained sustainability to me in kind of three different categories. And I think that explanation would be helpful for our audience. Could you give us how this large idea of sustainability is kind of broken up so people understand material health? Yeah, no, I think there's a, a couple ways to look at it. I know AIA just kind of brought out their own five-tiered idea, um, but I think the big, the big concepts that I tend to look at when we talk about sustainability, right? Because it's such a big word that everyone's using nowadays. Um, I kind of tend to look at three things. Is one, what we just talked about, which is human health, um, the impact that it has, and, and taking a look at what products are made of, what's in the things that we specify around us that we use on a regular basis. Um, there's also going to be the kind of impact that it has on the earth. So when we're looking at carbon emissions and footprints and, and handprints, and so all of those things embodied carbon, that's a really another conversation just as important, right? But we're taking a look at a different thing, really what we're doing today, how that impacts um, what the world's gonna look like five years, 10 years, 30 years from now. Um, and then I think the last part is the social aspect. So we're looking at how do the products that we have impact not only the communities that are you know, being built, but also the communities in which those products are being built in, right? The, the fence line communities, um, these third world countries that are impacted by our waste or our recycling. And so um, that more of social aspect. So those are kind of the three things that I tend to look at, focus on, and kind of paint the big picture to help people understand what this word sustainability means. So Antonio, as as a company at Millicare, uh, we're committed to sustainable cleaning solutions and we preach that the way you maintain the furnishings in your building has a far greater impact on the indoor environment than the off-gassing of the furnishing themselves. And that's kind of how I've always understood material health. So at face value, material health is only an issue during the off-gassing phase of new furnishings, right? I think that is where... A lot of people, we have that understanding, and it, it is an absolute important point, right? We, we have to really know, understand the impact of the product and when it's off-gassing, but it really starts way, way before that. And so when we look at material health, we're looking essentially at the very beginning of that product's life. 
Um, because if you think about a piece of furniture, for example, um, you know, if we know that it's got some off-gassing, well, what is that off-gassing coming from? Uh, is it PVC, right? Is it things like formaldehyde? How did those materials themselves get there to begin with? So you have to look all the way at the beginning of the supply chain, uh, all the way into the manufacturing of that product. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, that social aspect, right? If a piece of furniture has something very common like Chrome 6 in it, well, that Chrome 6 is getting onto that piece of furniture somewhere and someone is working in that environment. Right. Um, and so whether, you know, there are precautions or safety measures that are taken into place, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're preventing it from even getting some sort of exposure into that person, that community around that factory. Um, so it, it really starts way beyond way before um, that. And, and I would say even after. Right. Because considering the off gassing that's when the product is existing in that space at the beginning but then what about at the end of the life cycle of that product where does it go does it go into the landfill does it break down and then does that chrome 6 get into you know the drinking water through that process so really it's <laughs> from the beginning of the timeline all the way to the very end yeah yeah so you scared me a little bit there cuz you mentioned <laughs> pvc and i i think like a lot of my plumbing might be pvc piping so so you explained chrome 6 a little bit yeah, draw draw in a little bit of that PVC. What do you understand about that? Yeah, it's such a common thing that we use in our industry. Um, but if we take a look at that, there's still a lot of toxins that are used in the production of uh, of PVC, mercury, for example. Um, and so, just because it's not harmful, which it's not in its state as PVC, it's not harmful to us just sitting there, right? So you're not going to get cancer from you know, a PVC banding on a table, or like you said, our plumbing, fi you know, fixtures, things like that. We're not going to get sick because it's kind of in case it's not dangerous, but it, it's the conversation that we just had. What about the process in which it took to get there? You're still using these raw toxins to create this, this material that is so commonly used, so pervasive that there's really no other solution right now um, so we're just kind of like, meh, it is what it is. Um, but it's, it, you know, it, just because it's not harmful right in front of us, right? we really have to take a step back and look at the full picture. Um, what about the beginning? What about the end, right? Because something like PVC isn't going to break down in, the, in our lifetime. So it's right. also that impact of, all right, we're producing so much of it and it's going to be here for a very long time. Uh, what does that mean for future generations? Right, right. So you've made like you've, you've you've blown up material health, at least for me, right, taking in the beginning and the end. So this is like a daunting task. Do you do you look at these things on a daily basis? I, you know, I think if I looked at it every day, I might be super overwhelmed. <laughs> like you said, it's right. daunting. It is very daunting. But um, I think it's important. And the way that I kind of approach it is to have a continued conversation with people. Right. Um, so it's little chunks of information at a time or um, things like the group that I started, Texas Materials Initiative, um, which is a group that meets about once a month and just continues the conversation around education and what we can do. It's it's about, you know, 20 plus design firms across the state of Texas um, who just continue that conversation. So I think that's important as opposed to maybe, you know, I know there are people out there who do look at this every day um, and, and kudos to them. And, you know, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it can be very daunting, I'm sure, but I think it's important more than anything else to have a regular continued conversation to help people break it down bit by bit. So it doesn't seem so overwhelming, which I think tends to happen when we talk about material health or sustainability in general. True. So, so tell me a little bit more about the Texas Materials Initiative. What are some of the recent conversations you guys have had? Yeah, we actually we just had a phenomenal conversation with um, the director of sustainability at Canon Design around the circular economy. Um, so that kind of goes back to the very first topic that I talked, or second topic that I talked about, which was um, the impact that we have on the earth, right, in the materials that we're specifying, and how do we how do we specify products that kind of have this circular lifestyle, uh, life cycle, as opposed to a beginning and an end, um, which is fascinating. So, so that was a great conversation we've we've talked about in the past. How to really understand an HPD and an EPD and what the differences are, what to look for. We've uh, talked about things like declare labels 
And uh, so really, you name it, right? We've kind of dug into different points of the conversation, even embodied carbon. To me, what's I think kept the group successful and moving forward is that we kind of open the floor and say, hey, what do you guys want to focus on? What do you want to learn from each other? And who can we pull in and teach us different topics? And so it's, it's kind of been a wide range, but all very interesting things that I would have never learned otherwise. Yeah, you've given some credit to other folks, even in this interview, but credit to you on being a part of the Texas Materials Initiative. So I've, I've heard EPDs and HPDs from, from other guests, but take us through how the, what those are and how they're different. Yeah, so EPDs is really going to look at, um, and again, kind of goes back to the, the different categories that we think about when we're looking at sustainability. EPDs is going to look at what the impact is that that product it's itself has on the environment. So it looks at the life cycle assessment. It looks at the embodied carbon, uh, kind of where you're pulling your resources from. So it really paints a clear picture like, all right, this product has X impact on the earth um, versus this product, right? So it kind of helps as a really good comparison. And that's why I love about these labels. Um, and HPD is really going to break down into the material health portion, which looks at what is in the product. Um, what those chemicals or what those properties, what kind of impact they could have on human health. Um, but it's important to note that both right now are pretty much self-reported, right? So I'm coming, if I'm getting an HPD, I'm, I'm coming as a manufacturer and saying, hey, this is what's in my product. And I don't necessarily have to show everything that's in the product. I can say, you know, here's 20% of what's in my product, um, which is important, I think, at least to start the conversation right. when it looks when we're looking at HPDs, because then you can really say that, you know, X manufacturer is starting to look at what's what's there. Is it's a long process, right? It, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a full supply chain of breaking down formulas and chemicals and and product by product, um, but. HPDs at least start the conversation. So I always tell my designers, yes, it's great that you have an HPD or an EPD, but don't stop there. Really kind of take the time to look at, all right, is this 100% of what's in it? Is it telling me the full story? Is it looking at the life cycle for five years, 10 years, 20 years? You know, really kind of start to look at some key points. And of course, if you don't know what those are, I always say just, you know, that's what I'm here for. That's what a lot of other experts are here for. Um, reach out. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I like the environment and the human portion that HPDs and EPDs bring in. Are HPDs and EPDs taken into consideration in healthy building ratings like LEED and, and WELL? They are. They are. And I think um, with the new versions that have come out, it's a continued focus on how those things impact, um, you know, LEED, WELL, like you mentioned, even, um, you know, living building, other other things that are out there these certifications, these kind of product labels, they all help to tell the story um, and then also assess what the impact is. So it, they each have their own kind of points or, or way that they contribute. That's awesome. What companies are really trying to take a look at their products and kind of push in the material health arena? I will say um, carpet manufacturers for a long time have been well ahead of the curve um, just because I think awesome. they got a lot of pushback many years ago for, you know, some of the impacts that they were having on the environment. So they're definitely leading the charge when it comes to uh, materiality. But I will absolutely have to, I have to give credit, right, to Human Scale, who, who really kind of taught me and introdu introduced me to this topic because they're really – um, they're really walking the walk. And so as a furniture manufacturer, as you can imagine, you know, most people don't make every piece and part that goes into, right? You're not going to make the screw. You're not going to make the caster. You're going to purchase these things. And so it can be a very complicated process as a furniture manufacturer because you've got hundreds of parts and pieces, but they're really taking this step up and saying, no, we're not going to use anything with Chrome 6 or, you know, no, we're not going to put um, PFCs, which are stain resistant coatings on our textiles, which is almost ingrained in every textile without people knowing it. So they've really gone far and above. And of course, Autex, right? I have to give a shout out to Autex because I, you know, if they weren't privy to this information, if they didn't care about it, I probably wouldn't have made the jump. So uh, yeah. they're definitely because they make their own uh, PET panels, uh, which is very uncommon in the acoustics world, uh, they get to control what's in it. And so because of that, we, we make sure that there are no redless chemicals in any of our products. So um, I, those are the ones that come to mind, but 
there are many more out there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get a little controversial, right? So when it comes <laughs> to being transparent about products and materials, I I can see companies running into a little bit of a conundrum. Do they highlight the bad products or do they highlight the good ones? Give your give us your opinion. That is the conundrum. And you know, I think we are at a point in this conversation where I don't think it's an option anymore um, to be fully transparent. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, HPDs are a great start. And I think most people have caught on to that and they're getting HPDs, which is great, but it doesn't tell the full story. Um, and I think it's no longer okay not to tell the full story um, because before I think people were hiding under the guise of, oh, well, that's our information. Those are our secret recipes. That's our Coke formula. Um, but that doesn't work when you're talking about human health. Right. That doesn't work when you're talking about the potential impacts that your product can have on a pregnant woman or, you know, somebody who's just joined the workforce who's going to be sitting at that desk for 15 years. Um, it, it doesn't work anymore. And so that's why I think the industry has really started to push to things like declare labels, which are a lot more um, intensive, right? So there, you have to have 99% of what's in your product declared to get one of those. And so I think that's kind of the way that we're going. And it's no longer enough to say, yeah, we're not, we're not really going to disclose it, but uh, you know, our product is safe. Just trust us. It just doesn't work anymore, but it's a very controversial topic. Like you said, it's, it's not cheap for manufacturers. It's not easy right. for manufacturers, but I think it's, it's too important not to invest in that. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you do some education for architects and designers, specifically sometimes in these areas. So what classes do you teach or what have you taught in the past? I used to do a really great CEU, which was all around healthy materials. Um, and so that's one of the things. And I think what really helps Texas Materials Initiative is that we pull from everybody. So it's kind of everybody teaching everybody. Um, if I sit down and talk to people, I'm going to give you a manuf manufacturer's perspective on why, yes, it can be difficult, but why it's important, right, to be transparent. Um, but there are other perspectives out there that are just as insightful from the design side, from the contracting side. And so those all get pulled into the conversation. Um, but that's kind of my focus and where I come from, uh, along with things that we've talked about today, right? Like, why are these materials harmful? How can they be harmful? Who's out there regulating these things, uh, which unfortunately is not a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, just speaking from kind of my my passion and, and why it's so important. So that's kind of how I approach the topics. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. And I love that you're modest, right? Because you started talking about all of the information you get from, from TMI, which which I totally get. Before we get into regulation, though, what's what's the reaction to like your messaging or the classes that you give when uh, you, you know, you've got students there? What's their reaction? Yeah, it's 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 always fascinating to me because I think people people get it, but they don't really know how unregulated things are, how kind of wild west the manufacturing industry is. And so when people start to realize how many chemicals are being produced every year and like that nobody's really testing them before they have to come out and hit the market. They, you know, that's when people's eyes really start to get wide and they're like, okay, like maybe we should start paying attention to this stuff. And it always kind of, I feel like most of the time when I have a conversation with somebody, we always leave the conversation with a desire to learn more and figure out how they can make a difference. Right. And, and so that, that to me is my favorite part. When I get to tell my architects and designers, hey, you know, you don't have a control of what the client picks at the end of the day, but you have the power to say, well, you know, here are three options and all three options, you know, none of them have red list chemicals in them. So, so there is some, some power there and I love really getting them to see that, but it's always kind of a light bulb moment when we start to talk about material health. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little bit of that sphere of influence you were saying that uh, exactly. you challenge them with. No, I think that's great. So so we'll bring in kind of this regulation part, right? So when we're talking about this transparency, do we list the good stuff? Do we highlight the good stuff, I should say? Do we highlight the bad stuff? Um, how How is any of this regulated or governed? Yeah, that's just it. Um, so all these product labels and, and things that we're talking about, HPD, Declare, all that, none of none of that's really... There's no governing body uh, right now to say, hey, you have to do declare, you have to do HPD. 
um, the, the governing body that's out there is the EPA. Um, and a lot of people really think that the EPA um, has the capacity to protect us as as people you know people living here in the U.S. and and the reality is that they they're not really set up for success. I always like to make the comparison of we've got the EPA and and, and I like, I like to compare against the FDA, right? So the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, we we can't eat anything. There's no drugs that go on the market without them approving it. Zero, right? right? They have to test it to make sure that it's safe for us to consume. People think the EPA works that way, and they really don't. You know, so if we think think about things like lead paint or things like PVC that we're still using today, that I've told you have right, you right. know, these, these toxic chemicals, um, you have to prove. And I say you, you know, somebody out there saying this product, this material had a negative impact on my health. So, so the burden of proof is no longer on the manufacturer, right? It's not the manufacturer doesn't have to say it's safe the other party has to say this product is unsafe take it to the epa the epa then has to test it um and it goes from there so like i said think about how long it took to outlaw lead paint or you know many other harmful chemicals that we use asbestos right (laughs) yeah many many years in the market without having it uh restricted at all um so that's that's kind of the picture that i like to paint for people is there's there's not a lot of governance out there. And so it, the responsibility really lies on people like us, manufacturers, architects, designers, contractors, people in the space of creating the built environment. Uh, it's our responsibility to make sure that we're creating healthy spaces with healthy products that aren't going to harm the people that are in them. Yeah, yeah. And I'm encouraged by you know initiatives that you have as well as kind of the third party certifications that do help, you know, saying drive some demand, right? So I think you've helped us shift the paradigm paradigm on helping the environment, right? Yes, the health of the natural world and ecosystems are paramount. However, we should also consider the person that makes the products we demand. So your last thoughts on 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 that person? Yeah, it's always um, unfortunate because when we look at manufacturing, obviously we know a lot of manufacturing has gone outside of the US. Um, and a lot of that comes with a lot less regulation. Um, and so even though we're looking at things like, how do we use ocean plastic in our products? Super exciting stuff, right? How cool that we can make products out of plastic that's been out in the ocean or that would have ended up in the ocean. Like, this is so exciting. Well. Then we start to look at where we get this plastic from, because people would think, oh, this plastic comes from the recycling that I put in my, you know, recycle bin, uh, which unfortunately is incorrect, right? Almost like, I think it's 90%, if maybe a little less of our recycling ends up in the landfill itself. Wow. So we get some of the recycled plastic from third world countries where people are picking this plastic out of landfills. And so it's like a really great idea, this concept that we're creating this product or material out of recycled plastic from, you know, these these country the um, these countries. But it's you got to look beyond that too. And so there are great organizations out there like Next Wave um, Plastics who are taking a look at these things and making sure that the plastic that is uh, being used is is being done so in a safe way, uh, done so in a way that creates better jobs for these people in safer environments and and isn't, you know, forced labor, things like that. So there are organizations out there, but again, it, it, it doesn't do anyone any credit to just look at something face level. You've really got to dig down. And so whether that's the waste picker, right, in Indonesia or the person working at a PVC uh, at a Chrome Six or a PVC plant uh, in Asia somewhere, it, all those things have an impact. So, where are we creating the demand behind these things, and and where can we start to shift that demand? Um, because you know, as specifiers, we have that impact. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. I will never look at like a panel or a chair in an office building ever <laughs> again. Right, the same way I should say ever again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so listen, Antonio, thank you so much for exploring the great indoors with us today. Thank you. This was fun. <laughs>